Writing audio can be one of the most CPU-intensive tasks you can do. At the end of the day, volume's just a number. Say you want to fade audio, you reduce the volume by half, then by half again, and so on and so on until you're working with gradually smaller and smaller numbers. But as you're working with these smaller numbers, you're actually slipping into a category of numbers referred to as subnormals. And as you're calculating these subnormals, the cost of arithmetic can become even a few hundred clock cycles more expensive. This isn't just a theory, this is a real problem that affected a lot of different major DAWs, or digital audio workstations, back in the early 2000s. Back when Intel released their Pentium 4 CPU, a lot of major DAWs noticed massive performance degradation, and they were wondering what was going on. So what was happening? Well, the processor was actually properly handling calculating subnormal numbers to have more exact arithmetic. Audio engineers came up with crazy workarounds, such as adding constant fuzzing to audio tracks so that they would never slip down into that subnormal category of calculations. What was Intel's response? Yes, you are all wrong. You need to be compiling your code with proper SSE optimizations. It turns out, a microprocessor design made by Intel back in the 1980s is the reason why all modern audio software today has to disable certain CPU features. History lesson. Computers in the 60s and 70s did not have standards for floating point precision for handling rational numbers. You could run the same program on multiple different computers and come up with a different result every single time. But not only that, there were idiosyncrasies between assignment, comparison, addition, subtraction, multiplication, even on the same computer. All of these could round off numbers in a completely different and unpredictable way. Picture this. You're trying to multiply 3.141592 by 1.0, so just 1, and suddenly the number becomes 3.1414. Or you're trying to subtract a smaller number from a larger number, and suddenly the computer gives you 0 as the answer. This is going to cause some headaches inside of your code, and I don't really need any help introducing errors into programs, don't know about you. But programmers, you know programmers, came up with some really interesting workarounds to try to account for these issues. I think my favorite one is probably x equals x plus x minus x to try to throw all the operations into one calculation so you kind of get the correct level of precision, or at least a standard level of precision, from initial assignment. The Alpha back in those days then became trying to find the most affordable computer that offered the most accurate arithmetic calculations. I'm sure when you're trying to find your computer, the accuracy of the floating point calculations doesn't actually make it into your desired spec list. But people back in those days worried that accuracy of floating point calculations would become so expensive that quote unquote only AT&T and the Pentagon would be able to afford it. But why is this such a challenging problem to solve such that all major computer companies at the time were struggling so hard? Well to understand we have to take a look at how computers actually represent floating point numbers. Think of a number that's rational like one third which is 33% or 0.3333 infinitely however threes you are able to hold. If you're a computer, how do you represent this in a finite binary space? In order to handle this accurately and efficiently, computers use a special kind of scientific notation to represent floating point numbers. But by doing this, they introduce a very weird byproduct. So let me show you something really interesting. I'm gonna go over to Godbolt, and I have an example floating point number. I have 6.28, and I'm storing that into my floating variable over here. And if I look on the right hand side, you can see this is the disassembly of the compiled version of the application on the left. You can see there is no 6.28 anywhere in sight, but not only that, there is no scientific notation representation of this number. So how is this number getting accurately represented in the code? It all comes down to this long number over here. So if we take this long number, we can convert it over to binary in ones and zeros. And then if we separate those bits, they actually equal scientific notation. The first bit is gonna be the sign bit for positive and negative numbers. The second portion, which is the next eight bits, is going to be the exponent. And then the final 23 bits are going to be the mantissa. So you get the mantissa times two raised to the exponent with a bias which equals 1.57, lots of zeros, five, times two to the second power. And then if you add that in, 
that gives us our 6.28. But if you look closely, that's not 6.28. That is 6.280002. So you're probably thinking, Lori, you did something wrong inside of your calculations. Well, let me show you something even weirder. Here I have a very simple program. I'm gonna take my 6.28 number and put that in my floating point variable. And then I'm just going to print it to the console. So nothing crazy happening, just printing 6.28. So I'm going to print it out with four digits to the right of the decimal. Then I'm going to print it out with eight digits to the right of the decimal. So pause for a moment here. What do you think is going to get printed? So I'm going to run this. And here we have something interesting. You think my calculations were wrong before, but yet the computer agrees with me and backs me up on this. First, we have our four, which looks pretty good, 6.2800. But if we increase the precision a little bit and we go to the next level, we have 6.280021. So that's very interesting. Try this out on any machine you want. I guarantee you printing out 6.28 is not going to print out 6.28 as long as you add enough digits of precision. But at least it's consistently incorrect across all machines. Remember there was a time in history when you couldn't count on this kind of consistency. Not only that, but you might have noticed another issue with this way of handling floating point numbers. We only have a finite number of digits that we can use. So what happens if we reach a number too small to be able to be calculated in our 32 bits of data available to represent our scientific notation? Technically, the smallest number that can be represented by this is 1.17 times 10 to the negative 38. Arithmetic accuracy is the most important thing we can focus on. This kind of precision is literally impossible to keep up with the same speeds as our previous processor. Well, maybe you need to rethink your engineering. We already have it. No. When researchers at Intel were designing the i8087 microprocessor, they were aware of all these arithmetic inconsistencies, and they decided to have a standard for all different Intel machines so that they would produce the same result. They also wanted to have the best arithmetic that was also future compatible. Meanwhile, other companies like DEC, for example, had their own floating point standards. If you can call them standards, I don't really call them standards. DEC's solution was that once you hit a number that was small enough that uh, it entered that underflow state, they would just immediately flush it to zero, so you would lose all of that precision. Floating point standards became such a hot topic that over 12 people from different companies convened to discuss the creation of a standard. Now, Intel decided to use this committee to try to push their standards for floating point calculations. William Kahn from Intel even got permission to release the specifications for their unreleased i8087 processor to help convince the committee to adopt their standards for floating point calculations. Without giving away too much information, Intel had to convince the committee. But DEC, on the other hand, was over there saying that their standards were good enough and that Intel's proposal couldn't possibly run as fast as machines running their current arithmetic hardware. But the best rebuttal to this is that Intel already could. But Khan had to give away this fact without also giving away too many trade proprietary secrets for their unreleased microprocessor. This entire process took a very long time, but it eventually resulted in something beautiful the IEEE 754 floating point standard. And you can read this standard online today, but it basically provides a set of blueprints for machines to follow to standardize how they all calculate floating point numbers. Now, if you take a look at it right here, this might look a little bit familiar to you. We have how many bits comprise the sine bit, the exponent bits, as well as the mantissa. All of these different kinds of standardizations are comprised inside of this document. The biggest and most controversial solution proposed by Intel that did end up in the IEEE 754 standard was this concept of subnormals. Now previously, as soon as underflow was encountered, machines would just flush that number to zero, but that's a very abrupt change. So subnormals introduced the concept of gradual underflow. So it would slowly begin to introduce rounding errors to no into numbers so that the change was much more gradual instead of this very immediate change. This did come at a cost, however. Think of all those teeny tiny numbers. Your CPU now has to account for performing all of those calculations. Under the DEC standard, you could basically just flush them to zero and not have to worry about it. 
Under Intel's proposal, however, your CPU now had to have the complexity and the extra cost for performing each of those calculations. On x86, for example, this can add up to a hundred additional clock cycles. It's no wonder the companies fought so hard to not adopt the standard. Now after that history lesson, let's go back over to music and digital audio and how subnormals affect them even today. If you're thinking about fading audio, it's basically the perfect way of triggering subnormal behavior because you're gradually lowering and lowering volume and dealing with smaller and smaller number calculations. So you're eventually going to get over to that subnormal space. But if you think about it from a human ear perspective, this is far beyond the kind of precision necessary and it's beyond what the human ear can even detect. But this is such an important part of digital workstations that even if you look at it today, you can still see the traces of this. I, for example, have created a plugin for Reaper, which is a DAW, and I want to demonstrate that even the first line, this is the first code by default, of the user code for your plugin is a line disabling subnormals. So subnormals are also known as denormals. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to demonstrate fading audios with and without subnormals enabled. Now, if we look at trying to disable subnormals, that flag was not the only thing I had to do. And I actually had a really hard time getting subnormals to fully disable so I could demonstrate a CPU spike for a difference for a few different reasons. First of all, ARM handles them completely differently. So the difference in time that it takes to calculate these on ARM is very different and basically negligible. So I had to go over to x86-64 to even be able to see a difference. Now, actually get them, getting them to disable, I also had to add specific compiler flags as well. Let's take a look at an example real quick. I compiled one version of this simple program just regularly, and then I compiled a second version with fast math so we could disable those subnormals as kind of a sanity check to make sure they really didn't work. Now let's take a look at what actually happens with these. I have this very simple program that's going to test and see whether a number is subnormal or normal, and this is indeed a subnormal number. I took our 6.28 and just added a lot of zeros. Not always reliable for generating a subnormal, but it worked. So now I've compiled this in two different versions. So I'm going to run this just with our regular uh, float code. And you can see we have calculated a subnormal and this gives us our 0.000 whatever, 6277 approximation of our 628. But if I use my second version with the fast math flag and I run this, I'm going to get my fast code. You can see zero detected. It just went ahead and flushed to zero. Now for the most exciting part. I have Reaper open and I have a ton of tracks inside and I have my plugin loaded. I'm going to turn it on and off and show you the optimized versus not optimized version, AKA denormals versus not denormals inside of this. So we can see the CPU spiking in action. Now, first of all, let's go over to our optimized fade version and let's just watch this CPU spike. I have my CPU performance monitor right here. I'm going to go over to my track and let's just start playing it. You can see CPU is about at 22%. There's a lot of tracks here, so we can really see that kind of CPU usage increase. And I'm going to select all my tracks and I'm going to enable my optimized plugin. So remember this one has no subnormals, so we shouldn't see too much of a CPU spike. So we're gonna turn this on. And we see, you know, we're getting like, you know, extra 10%. We're stabilizing at around 32% CPU usage. So I'm gonna turn this one off. And now let's go over to our other version. This is the one where I have all of the subnormals disabled. So I'm gonna play, let's go over to our beginning, play our audio. You see we're at like our 22% CPU usage. And now select all my tracks, wait for this. Turn on my plugin and boom! <laughs> we go up to like 64% CPU usage. That, that's pretty crazy. I think that's a very large difference. So if you're just like minding your own business one day and you happen to be listening to music, well, I've got a lot of tracks here, and you just suddenly have CPU at like 100%, well, now you know what's happening. Now as a final bonus, I wanna take a look at what's actually happening with these subnormal flags when they're compiled inside of an application. 
If you take a look at the application, the code's gonna look exactly the same. So I've taken my music plugin and I have decompiled this and thrown this inside of Ghidra, my favorite disassembler decompiler, and here's the code. So here's the specific function, if we go over and look at this, where our no denormals is being set to true. So if we go back over to Ghidra and double click on this, you can see this is actually setting different flags that the CPU is going to be able to recognize. So the FPU sees when these particular flags are set, and then if they are, it has two options for performing its execution process. In one option, it's going to flush all of those to zero, and the other option is going to perform all these additional steps to properly calculate these subnormal numbers. Now, music is a very good way to demonstrate issues with floating point calculation challenges, but there's also a lot of other fields that this really affects and applies to. Finance is another really good example that floating point calculation ac accuracy is extremely important. If you think about trying to trade on a stock exchange, for example, you might have these little tiny inaccuracies with floating point calculations, but after thousands and thousands of trades are occurring, this is going to turn into a very non-negligible issue. So which side are you on? Would you argue Intel's side for hyper-precision being the utmost priority? Or are you on the other side saying that this hyper-precision has caused too many headaches over the years and should be disabled by default? Leave your opinions in the comments section below. So thank you so much for watching everyone, and until next time, Lori Wired out.